Hello, my name is Renata and I am a certified cooperative business developer. I was invited by the Center for Global Justice to share with you today what a co-op business is, what it does, and how co-ops can help us build a more resilient economic system. So the first question I want to answer today is what a co-op is. A co-op, the simplest way to understand it is that it is a business. But there are three things about it that make it very different from traditional businesses. First, a co-op is always owned by a group of people who have a common goal. And these people control the co-op on the basis of one member, one vote, rather than one share, one vote basis, as in other types of businesses. And finally, the benefits of a co-op are not necessarily monetary. People usually start them because they are looking to satisfy a need that is not being met otherwise. This can be housing or healthcare or um, delicious organic food. And these benefits, including the monetary ones, are distributed back to the ownership and the basis of use. Now, that structure can come in many different flavors. The ones that we are most used to as consumers are consumer co-ops, mostly in the form of food co-ops, and particularly with the rise of the organic and local movement. But there's also housing co-ops, where the residents own and control a particular property. Credit unions are also another form of co-ops that is quite visual in the, in the public eye. And they can be huge, like the ones we know in the United States, or they can be very small and all over the world. The other type of co-op is worker co-ops. And self-explanatorily, it's where workers own the corporation where they, where they do their labor. On the other hand, there's producer co-ops where separate producers gather together to either market their products under the same name and branding, or they also share infrastructure. And they can be quite big, like the ones in the American Midwest. Another type of co-op are social co-ops. These are um, most popular in Europe, and they're targeted towards elder care and people with disabilities. And in the most recent year, there has been a rise in um, platform co-ops, where a group of people or communities around the world own um, a web platform to reach a particular goal. As you can see, this exists all over the world. Um, they can be all sizes. They are in any types of industries. And I am also going to focus on the ones in the United States today, because it's where most of my work has taken place. And another important distinction about cooperatives from other businesses are the seven principles. The first co-op principle is voluntary and open membership. Nobody can force anyone to be part of a co-op and it has to be open to anyone who is willing to take on the responsibility of being a member. The second one, as we saw, is democratic member control. Co-ops are, are controlled on the basis of one member, one vote. The third one is member economic participation. And this one speaks too greatly about how co-ops are fueled and sustained by members' capital, and members um, benefit from them. But it also speaks to how a co-op is not the type of corporation that can be far away from your home, where you can just invest your money and forget about it and benefit from it economically without directly being um, involved with the ups and downs and the consequences or the pollution or the bad decisions that the corporation has. People are very intimately tied to the co-op's workings. The fourth one is autonomy and independence. No outside entity can dictate the workings of the co-op or the decisions. It only has to be the membership. 
The first one is a commitment to education, training, and information. This helps people, if they're going to own a piece of the co-op, to really understand how the business is working and its health, so they can make better decisions on it. The sixth one is cooperation among cooperatives. And the seventh one is a concern for the community. And though these principles sound like it's something that it can be easily ignored, co-ops take them very seriously. You will often see them painted on the walls or on the forefront of the websites. Co-ops use them often to build a lot of their business decisions and their identities. So they are taken to heart. And so you get an idea of how extensive the co-op movement is. And desired numbers from the International Cooperative Alliance. In 2014, they did a co-op census and they found that there's 2.6 million co-ops in 145 countries. They generate 12.6 million jobs and around $3 trillion in revenue. Just in the US, there's 30,000 co-ops generating 2.1 million jobs and around $400 million in revenue. So as a summary, I really like the USDA definition of co-ops because it's the most simple one to wrap our heads around, but there are many others that are also excellent. Just remember that a co-op is a user-owned, user-controlled business that distributes benefits on the basis of use. There's one member, one vote policies, and there's seven principles to them. So now you have a pretty good idea of what a co-op is. Let's move on to some economic analysis as to how co-op economics are quite different than the way we do things right now. The first aspect I'd like to cover is efficiency. We have a common belief that the market is the most efficient way to provide goods and services. And I would like to make the case today that we need to reframe what efficiency really means. When we are developing a business, the first thing we are told to ask is, how can my business fulfill a need that is currently not being met? And yet somehow we end up with all colors of the rainbow, types of candy, glow-in-the-dark nail polish, disposable barbecues, while very fundamental needs go unmet. And in the context of a financial system where it does not make sense to make an investment if it will not generate revenue. This is quite natural. However, there are gaps that are very essential and both governments and the markets are failing to meet. And this is an area where co-ops really shine. An example of this is the story of US electric, um, electric co-ops. And this goes back to 1935 where only urban areas had electricity and Roosevelt was trying to revitalize the country with the, new deal, with the New Deal. Roosevelt set up the Rural Electrification Administration and started giving out loans to private utilities to electrify the countryside. Yet none of them would apply since it wouldn't generate enough revenue for them. And it makes sense that a lot of infrastructure for a town of 200 people wouldn't be a good investment for them, but this left a lot of people literally in the dark. And farmers catching on to this, they started doing um, electric co-ops and applying for these loans. And this is how most of rural areas in America got um, electricity, and these co-ops are still around. What I want to illustrate with this example is the concept of value. So co-ops, since they are not tied to generating revenue for their shareholders, they are much more focused into generating other types of value. That shows this multidimensionality of value very well. To some people, value might mean comfort or joy or clean water. And in our current system, we only see this as dollars. So it's very simpli um, simplifying and reductionist. When there are things that are essentially valuable for some people and are worthless to others, we're bound to have inequalities. And this is why co-ops um, 
are just much better suited for creating and maintaining uh, common goods. Now, the business world has started catching on to this, and this is how the certified B Corporation appeared, and that is the benefit corporation. So these are corporations that are not legally tied to having to create um, money for their shareholders. They can have other visions, they can have other values, and they can have other priorities. And th this is a great step in the right direction. Um, B Corps still retain an inequality in ownership, of the, which might be appropriate sometimes. But there are really interesting things that happen to social dynamics when equality of ownership is done right. And this moves on to the next aspect of co-ops we can look at today. So the quality of work environment. Now, we have all suffered at some point of this, the group project nightmare. And there's egos, and there's the need to be right, and there's power traps. So it's no wonder why we generated hierarchy and command and control um, ways to organize our social systems. So just leaving things to one person to make the decisions and then make um, a slackers reprimanded. And we seem to have a lot of faith in this, uh, which is <laughs> what often keeps people skeptical from co-ops actually working. Unfortunately, the command and control social dynamic also brings on some consequences that we all know very well. So apathy at work, disconnection, resentment, and aside of the sheer existential crisis, the more we value command and control type of the structures, the greater the pay gap is going to be between staff and management. And this just leads to greater social inequality um, repercussions overall in our society. The companies are finding ways to get better and better into motivating the workforce and connecting with them genuinely. In my opinion, this is a patch for the deeper problem that people are disenfranchised and lacking fundamental open communication and support in the workplace. So I want to show you one of the happiest places I have ever visited in my life. And this is the headquarters of Union Cab in Madison, Wisconsin. So Union Cab is a worker co-op. It started in 1979 with 11 cabs. And now there's 65 cabs and 171 drivers, five mechanics, 24 dispatchers, and three IT people. Now you might be wondering what a team this size does to keep organization going while they are all governing this um, corporation at once. Well, they do it with a very intricate uh, system of governance. They do have a general manager but this person is hired and supervised by a board of directors elected from the membership. There's some management staff as well who reports to them, and everything else is done through committees. So drivers are compensated, well, not only drivers, also the rest of the staff is compensated for their governance time as their driving time. And with the wages that are paid for of governance, um, it's quite efficient for them since with the number of hours, it would be equal to two and a half uh, full-time positions. For a company making $6 million in annual revenue, this is a really good price. So it's actually quite efficient for them. And since they are not paying someone about $80,000 a year to do the human resources work that they take care of, they can keep a very small um, pay ratio between the highest and lowest pay. So, oh, excuse me, we're in the middle of coronavirus crisis and I'm having a very nasty cough. <laughs> so the pay ratio at Union Cab is 2.5 to 1 from the highest and the lowest. And depending on seniority level, drivers can make up to $40,000 a year. They have health insurance. They have guaranteed 40-hour weeks. 
and this is a great contrast to the traditional cab industry where drivers lease their car from the company so in slow nights they can end up owing money to the company so the money wise the difference is not huge for cab drivers in union cab the quality of the environment is night and day talking to some of them who have worked for other cab companies um, they say that the quality of the relationships and the environment um, is what really keeps them working at Union Cab. And this is not because there, uh, there is no conflict. Um, it's more because they have found really healthy avenues for dealing with conflict. One of the anecdotes um, that was shared with me while my time in Union Cab was that one of the cabbies felt that he was getting less less calls than everyone else and instead of him being afraid of bringing this up or being reprimanded by a boss or simply being told that that wasn't true the comedians got to work into looking up at the numbers for the month and showing this to him and then saying like hey you got as many calls as everyone else so this is a very different approach to communication and to inclusion and to respect and dignity of a worker than what we seem to know in traditional companies. Um, and finding this less tense environment where there's just more space for generosity, I am gonna post, uh, post that this is um, what can make co-ops very resilient. In 2008, when the rest of the companies were just firing people left and right, union cap members got together and they voted to take a pay cut and to for people with families to have more hours. Um, the people without families um, took some of their vacation time. So people could fare through this crisis without anyone losing their jobs there was that willingness to work and to talk to each other and to be flexible and to find other ways. Now, this is just one case of co-op resiliency, but if we wanna look at the statistics of it, there's actually been studies in Quebec and British Columbia about the survival rate of cooperative businesses after five years of start. The numbers they looked at was or the results that they found was that co-ops survive 62% at a rate of 62% while other businesses were about 30%. 30, uh, 30 and the beautiful thing is that without the social and professional obligation to close down an operation that is not generating income, Co-ops have greater flexibility in, this, in the face of chaos. But they don't only keep this resiliency to themselves. There is an ecosystem of support and mutual aid that grows from co-ops. And this we'll see in the principle six. So this cooperation among co-ops has become a trade movement where inside co-ops there is a sign to identify what other products come from co-ops. But this is not just reduced to promoting, um, promoting each other. The, through the National Cooperative Grocers Association, for example, food co-ops can share data for trends, they share software, they support each other with accounting systems, they do bulk ordering. And now through these really tough times, they've mobilized emergency loans. Um, there's a strategy, emergency plans, mutual aid, and then lots of help redesigning live trainings into virtual ones. So co-ops, not only in the times of emergency have been doing this, and they also extend this to their, the communities around them. In 2012, the National Cooperative Association, um, National Cooperative Grocers Association, commissioned a third party to do a study for them on the impact of uh, food co-ops on their economies. And these are the numbers that they came up with. And the ones I'd like to point out is the number of purchases locally sourced were 20% in average from a food co-op 
rather than 6% from other types of businesses. They used an average 157 uh, local suppliers rather than just 65. And their economic multiplier factor was of 1.6. So meaning that for every $1,000 invested in the co-op, $1,600 were generated in that community, significantly bigger than the ones invested on other types of businesses. So co-ops care about strengthening the local um, businesses, but the fourth and most rich aspect I have found with working with co-ops is the human enrichment that goes through there. And the, the deep transformations that people really make in having ownership of the corporations that they get to interact with every day. There are so many examples of this, but the one I want to share with you today is one of the most moving ones um, of Rock USA. I had the privilege of seeing one of their presentations through my co-op training. And Rock USA is a nonprofit that helps create co-ops from um, manufactured home parks. Now, manufactured home parks have the fame um, of being the last resort for many people and lots of connotation of crime or degradation. These communities have it pretty, have it particularly difficult in our current economic system since it's too expensive for them to actually move their houses. Um, therefore, there is no economic incentive for landlords to maintain the place nicely because residents will put up with rain hikes, with rent hikes, or low maintenance um, since it's often um, virtually impossible for them to move these houses. Now, whenever one of these parks gets sold, it's a big driver of homelessness and bankruptcy for the working poor. People lose their lives, their savings in a very short notice. So the founders of Rock USA wanted to solve this problem and they did it in a very innovative solution. So they would go into parks that were for sale and train the residents to um, to apply for a loan and buy the, buy the park themselves and then run it together as a cooperative. Um, they designed their payment schedule with the residents as, as part of the amortization schedule so their fees can keep, um, are accessible for the members and they could keep fueling Rock USA's work to um, create more co-ops. Um, the most moving part about this, though, is the soft skills that people were learning, people who were very much feeling in the fringes. Um, they learned how to run um, very effective meetings, make decisions together, make um, financial systems together, look at the health of their co-op. And what they saw in the communities was just this amazing increase going from very neglected places to people planting gardens and really investing in the communities they were living in. And while treating each other with dignity and allowing for their potential to shine and care for the environment of the community, a lot of them ended up finding a lot of skills that they had never seen before. And there uh, were even anecdotes of some of the members um, who thought that that was it for their lives um, after serving on the board of the co-op, then running for office, finding better jobs, and really making their lives much more fulfilled. So this is what I find is the true gold of cooperatives, just how it makes people feel to be very involved um, in a corporation, and then getting to have their needs met in a way that is flexible and humane. Now, I don't want to make this sound like it is the gold, the silver bullet for all our social problems. Co-ops do have problems. And I'd say the first one is this fussiness and oblivion as to exactly what they are, even within the co-op movement. So there are certain co-ops. Um, a good example of this is Mondragon in Spain, 
Mondragon is a conglomeration of about 120 co-ops of all different um, industries, and lots of manufacturing industries, lots of financial co-ops. But they have, um, they have corporations abroad that they own and that whose workers are not members of the co-op. They are not included in this. So there is a, um, the separation felt between the privileges of the co-op members and the people outside of them. So this is something that many co-ops that are truly committed to the Southern Co-op principles are seeking to defend and finding ways to make them legally binding and have more impact. The second one is uh, that there's um, the competition and the strategy of having to live in a world where still profit is the top um, goal. So co-ops, since um, especially food co-ops, since their products are much higher quality, they're trying to give fair, fair prices to anyone, pay fair wages to their employees. They do end up being more expensive and having to deal with this constant friction of being in a monetary system that sees profits as the top margin. And I'd say the third problem is that Co-ops do require us to interface with each other at a much deeper level, learn nonviolent communication, um, solve problems rather than trying to avoid them through command and control. And this is not always easy for us. Um, we have to learn to be vulnerable and step into new territory, healing the very dysfunctional communication we tend to have ingrained in us. So it is challenging, but I promise you, it is so worthy. Um, I, for myself, have had such a privilege working with co-ops and feeling my heart so enriched by them and seeing what uh, common work can do all over the world. So... This is my intro to co-ops and what their economic implications are, how they can help us build a better world. And there is so much more to it. So I'll be doing some more videos diving into other aspects of it. But if you have any questions, please contact me. Also, I am leaving all the resources and all my sources for creating this video. Uh, so dive into them, look at co-ops and see if it sparks any ideas as to how it can help us in this very critical time as we rethink all our economic systems and see what departs for the future. <laughs>